Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. You can find all the old shows, links to our blogs, our Twitters, uh, find old shows, stuff like that on there. Also, I have Jeff Squires on the line, the usual co-host here from OpenMPI and Cisco. Jeff, thanks again for your time. Hey, Brock. This is always good stuff. You know, as usual, this is uh, an opportunity for us to to learn about some things that we don't normally get exposed to. And sometimes one or, or the other of us knows a little bit about the project uh, that we're we're talking to today. And uh, today, I think that's you. You know a bit about our our guest in the project. So why don't you go ahead and introduce him? Our project today is the Atlas Project, not to be confused with the previous Atlas Project we had on the show that had to do with the Large Hadron Collider. This is the Automatically Tuned Linear Algebra Suite, which is something, was one of the very first things I did as a sysadmin was building this once. So our guest is Clint Whaley, who's at the University of Texas at San Antonio. And Clint, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? I'm uh, Clint Whaley, the lead developer of Atlas, and that's automatically tuned linear algebra software. Oh, sorry about that. See, this is why we always ask next, (laughs) what is Atlas? (laughs) (laughs) So automatically tuned linear algebra software, it's a package that uh, attempts to use empirical techniques to auto-adapt itself to run very efficiently on uh, any set of hardware. Um without you know, knowing priori what the best techniques are. It tries a bunch of things and picks out the best ones and produces for you a, t- a highly tuned library of linear algebra uh, kernels, mainly something called the BLAS, basic linear algebra subprograms, as well as some routines in LAPAC, uh, linear algebra package. So who should use these routines? What are these routines and why are they of interest? Well, uh, a whole boatload of people use them without being aware that they use them. Um, Linear algebra underlies most of scientific computing. Uh, I'll get a lot of hate mail for that, but it's roughly true. Uh, Most scientific uh, modeling uses either sparse or dense linear algebra, and ATLAS uh, is what helps people with with the dense linear algebra part. and uh, the ways in which people use them, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of users out there, but most of them don't realize they're using it. For instance, it's built into uh, OS X, Apple's package, where they use linear algebra routines to do spam filtering and some graphics rendering. Those call Atlas underneath. Uh, if you use MATLAB, Maple, Octave, these kind of problem-solving environments, uh, chances are you've used Atlas or one of its proprietary counterparts. It, they link the different executables for different systems. Uh, there's some proprietary packages like MKL, which provide uh, substantially the same features of, as Atlas in a proprietary package. So you've called it if you've used one of those problem-solving environments, uh, most likely. So what kind of performance do you see for uh, like an Atlas routine versus, say, the reference implementation of, like, Let's take the normal dense matrix multiply, the classic benchmark that everybody uses. Yeah, for dense uh, linear algebra, if you do a dense matrix multiply of a large size, let's say, and let's call large size 2,000 by 2,000 or larger, something like that, um, then you can expect speed ups that range from factors of 3 to factors of 100, just depending on your system. Um, to put it in another way, uh, Atlas will often run very near the theoretical peak limit of the machine for a very large square matrix multiply. So, for instance, uh, it's not uncommon to get 90% of theoretical peak with that kind of an operation. So then how much, how much time does it take to hand-tune one of these operations for a single hardware platform if a user was going to do this themselves? Well, um, the problem is it's an indefinite length of time uh, because optimization is never done. So in the past, like but when Atlas was first beginning, it was very common that Atlas was faster than any proprietary package. But of course, Atlas was, and so what's the reason for that? Well, the proprietary packages didn't have a lot of competition in those days. Intel didn't produce one for the PowerPC, for instance. So IBM's 
only competed against themselves. So when Atlas came along, you can't lose to a free piece of software. And the people hand-tuning realized, oh, there's more hand-tuning to be done. And so then they would improve even further. So how long it takes widely varies depending on the platform. And when do you call it quits? Unless you have some reason to know there's more to be achieved, people often give up long before they reach good performance. But in the past, when, a hard, when hardware would come out, it might take as much as a month before an optimized version was, uh, was finalized. So it could take quite a long time to tune these uh, routines. Now, what kind of optimizations and tunings do you do? I mean, what do you do that, that makes these operations so fast other than, uh, you know, the, the canonical three-line matrix, matrix, multiply that you see in textbooks? I mean, why, why does that take so long, and, and how do you do it better? Well, the gateway optimization for all of lin dense linear algebra is blocking, or if you're in the compiler community, you call that tiling, where you basically break the problem up into smaller problems that will fit into the cache. And the reason, of course, is everyone knows because of architecture, um, memories are hundreds of thousands of times slower than processors effectively now. So most operations, including the, the normal three-loop implementation of matrix multiply, run at the speed of memory, which is much, much slower than the speed of the processor. So you first block them. And until you block the operation, no other, no other optimization matters. It doesn't matter whether you uh, do loop unrolling or anything else because you're running at the speed of memory regardless. Once you've done blocking, now, now you can run, now your theoretical peak is, is being held down by the speed of your computational performance. And that means there's a whole host of now optimizations you have to apply. Loop unrolling, unroll and jam, register block, um, uh, um, instruction scheduling, all these kinds of operations that become important only after you've removed the memory bottleneck. And so Atlas does all of those things, and it does them in several phases, uh, depending on also on their different routines we're talking about. Uh, and I can go into more detail if you'd like to, uh, to know more about that. Sure, I'd, I'd love to hear more. So, for example, what, uh, what is this whole automatically part of, of your name? So, I mean, how are you different, for example, than Intel's MKL other than, uh, than just being free? Right. So um, the answer is we're not as much different as we used to be, but it's because they've become more like me rather than the reverse. Uh, if you talk – so, you know, originally you had – the proprietary people did mostly hand tuning. You know, they had teams of very good, you know, usually assembly programmers who would do all the optimizations that I just briefly outlined. Um, but when I talk to the Intel guys now, they all use a lot of empirical techniques. So, for instance, one Intel uh, engineer described to me, like, one of the issues you have is to try to find out the best scheduling for all the instructions and the x80 at the assembly level. And the x86 assembly is old and it has a lot of tricks in it. There are, you know, maybe 10 different ways to do the same operation. And so what they actually have now, according to, to this engineer, is when they come out with a new chip, instead of trying to hand tune and find what the best assembly sequence is, they have a big generator that generates basically, you can think of it as a massive supercompiler. And they run for weeks to find the exact sequence of instructions that will drive that hardware at its peak rate. Now, that's a level of empirical tuning that Atlas just doesn't have because I can't concentrate that much on just one machine like they can. But that shows you the power of the empirical techniques that I think, I'm guessing, almost all the big vendors now use something similar. So I think most people are empirical these days uh, in an automated way. So what kind of things are you looking for? Are you looking for cache size, number of floating point units, uh, availability of vector instructions? What, what are some of the things you're looking for? Right. So um, the, as I said, the most important thing that Atlas does first is it tries to find a good blocking factor. And in, in order to do that, it probes for your L1 cache size. Now, Atlas blocks for the level 1 cache primarily, uh, does multiple levels of blocking, but uh, our first level of blocking L is L1. Some other blahs, for instance, the Goto blahs, block more for the L2. 
um, which on modern systems is actually usually a good idea because out-of-order execution engine can handle the scheduling uh, part of, in other words, you can hide a latency to memory, but you can't hide the throughput costs. And so you can get enough throughput, Goto uh, wrote a paper about this, you can get enough throughput out of the L2 cache on most modern systems so you don't need to block for the L1. Atlas is a little conservative wondering about uh, systems where this is not the case, particularly historically. There was a lot of systems where there was a big difference in throughput between the L1 and the L2. So we block for the L1, which also has some nicer effects when you're doing applications like LU and QR because your blocking factors can be smaller. But it does uh, sometimes uh, affect the asymptotic uh, speed of the, of the, of the system. Um, so let's see if I can remember the question. <laughs> I believe you said also, you know, what kind of things we do. So we try to find the cache size. That, in ter that allows us to infer a range of blocking factors we, we can choose. We then look through those blocking factors, because that's just a bound on how big you should make the matrix. We find uh, what an actual good blocking factor is. Then we start, so Atlas does a series of different searches all doing various things. The primary one, the one that's been around since Atlas version 0 0.1, is a generator, an, a C code that generates other C codes, and what it generates is differing implementations of matrix multiply that have had various techniques applied to them, and there's a whole host of techniques in that generator, but the most important ones are register blocking, unro loop unrolling, and unroll and jam. Um, and then, like I said, there's a host of smaller ones, but they, they are usually accounting for less than 5% of the, of, the, of the speed that you're seeing. Uh, I forgot the prefetch. Prefetch is also important on some systems, uh, software-controlled prefetch. Uh, and so that's the main search of Atlas. And then Atlas has some subsidiary searches that do various things, like we have a code generator specifically for SSE now. We have a, a series of hand-tuned cases that Atlas tries and just picks the best one empirically, and so on. So uh, I guess I'll stop there, and you can ask me more questions if you're more interested in more details. So you mentioned the Goto library in there. Um, they always write up that, it's, that they're focusing on TLB misses uh, as a translation, look-aside buffer. Are you guys doing anything with that? Um, what's your feeling on that? Yeah, they make a big deal out of that, but it's actually not true. Um, you know, I... If you look at what they're, you know, they they wrote a paper originally where they claimed that it's all about the TLB and that's why they're better than, for instance, Atlas. Uh, on a, they used some systems where they were, you know, beating Atlas by quite a quite a bit. I, I want to say 20 or 30 percent. Um, Atlas was running like at 80 percent, and they were running at 95 percent of peak or something something like that. I mean, it, it was quite a startling difference. But uh, it's and they claimed it was from this TLB issue, but. Of course, Atlas handles the TLB perfectly. It's nothing to do with TLB. They, they would beat Atlas by a similar amount for a matrix that fits in one page. <laughs> so it's nothing to do with the TLB. Uh, I mean, what they're, I don't think that that's a completely wrong point. Um, you do have to realize that if you, if you get larger block factors, um, that the TLB can limit your effective L2. That was one of the big points of their paper once they'd fixed the fact that they were claiming the TLB made all the difference. It is true that what you have to do is you have to say, the size of the L2 I want to use is not necessarily the L2, if I'm blocking for the L2. Uh, it's the size of the L2 that the TLB can, can index. But Atlas handles all that correctly. Um, the real difference between me and them on that particular machine that they originally talked about, the TLB, is their assembly was a heck of a lot better than mine. So it sounds like it can really be an arms race, uh, given a particular platform, a particular compiler, a particular even chip. How do you how do you stay ahead of this? Well, I mean, the reality is I I usually don't. Um, you know, unlike most other efforts, all my stuff's open source. So all my competitors, you know, I usually beat my competitors for one release of their software. Right? Then they go and look at look at my. I mean, I say competitors. I mean, what I mean is people who also provide the blogs. But, you know, if I have a great idea, I publish a paper on it and uh, embody it in software and give it to everybody. So, you know, the only reason that I beat anyone after I've done that is that they haven't, you know, looked at the software yet. Um, so, uh, like I say, in the past, it was very common for Atlas to be noticeably faster 
than the vendor blahs. But, you know, these days that is very, I mean, it still happens because Atlas does some stuff automatically. Uh, at least I know it happens in the past because they don't tune everything, and Atlas tends more to tune everything. So, you know, they'll tune the thing, you know, they'll, they'll beat Atlas by a substantial amount on the stuff that people are normally benchmarked. But then you take the transpose setting or you do uh, uh, some kind of weird non-regular shape and Atlas suddenly wins. I mean, I've, I've gotten users, you know, who've, back in the day I've, you know, I've known I'm losing by, let's say, 10 or 20% to the vendor blahs. And so I'll tell a guy, you know, well, you ought to use the vendor blahs because, you know, I'm losing by 20% on this platform that you're talking to me about. And they'll say, no, I did, and you're five times faster because I'm worried using the strange case, right, even though you're actually much slower for an asymptotic one. So, uh, so anyway, I mean, I think that, uh, um, you know, to actually know, you know, what most people know about matrix multiply is a number. This is how big it, this, is, this is the speed you get on a gigantic square matrix. That's what most people will know from a benchmark. But that is really usually not at all related to what the performance you'll see in your application. So you really have to, if you really want to evaluate what one you should use, you really want to just link it in your application and see which one runs faster for you because it's so complicated that benchmarking it externally is, uh, can be quite misleading. That is quite a familiar story coming from the MPI side of the world. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's quite a familiar story in HPC, right? You hear a great number, you buy the machine, and on your stuff it's just terrible, right? Uh, and then you have to, if you actually want to understand it, you have to spend, you know, three weeks studying it, then you find all the things that separate you from whatever benchmark you were looking at, and, you know, then you realize what's going on. But it's, 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 uh, it's an ugly truth. So is Atlas generating uh, parallel or, or serial code? And there's a couple directions to go from here, but let, let's start with that one. So Atlas, most of the generation is done for uh, the serial code, and we then leverage the serial code in order to build the parallel codes. And the parallel codes are also, we've just started doing empirical tuning on the parallel side. In other words, trying to figure out what's the most effective way to spawn threads, that kind of thing, and applying that. We're just now working on that. Uh, now, there is some talk long term about the idea, you know, if architectures continue to scale like they are, the, ser the serial case will be interesting only in the sense that you use it inside of a parallel program. And so there's some talk uh, uh, that we might want to start switching to doing the opposite, where we tune for the parallel case directly, and then we give you a, a serial interface, and not because you're going to call the serial blahs, but because you're going to write your own parallel routine, and you want to handle the parallelism and not have Atlas do it, right? You don't want Atlas to make its own threads, for instance. Um, but in either one of those cases, it might make more sense in a more heavily parallel world to tune everything using parallel code. Um, and the reason you might want to do that is uh, parallel code is more memory starved than serial code. And when you do an empirical tuning, what you're doing is you're actually timing something. And you're saying, did it get an improvement? But now let's pretend we have two implementations, one of which uh, has a better register blocking on it. So it uses less uh, loads from memory. But if you time it in serial, you might not see any difference between that and the lesser uh, routine. They might run the same speed because you're not saturating the bus with only one thread running at a time. Whereas if you had uh, 24 threads running at a time, you would see a startling difference between these two different implementations because the, the serial overhead was not being exceeded, but the parallel one is. And so that's an argument that Atlas ought to reverse its, its installation scheme and do all the tuning in a parallel mode where you artificially create uh, runs that are happening on all the threads, and then we can distinguish more when, the, when you're starved for memory between the guys. So that's something we're looking at, but it requires, of course, as you might imagine, a substantial rewrite. So we haven't done it yet, and so far it's not critical because we're talking usually eight-way parallelism now, and some lucky people have 24-way parallelism. But when we start talking about hundreds of wave parallelism, it's going to be critical, I think. So are you focusing more on parallelism inside the server then, so multi-core kinds of acceleration? So Atlas does only uh, shared memory parallelization. You know, 
if you want um, distributed memory parallelization, you you take a package like ScalaPack and it calls you know the blobs, which is Atlas, right? That's the way you do that. So yes, we do mostly uh, threading inside of Atlas, and we're you know we're doing a lot of research now on on the proper ways to do threads. There's see Atlas is a very a very uh, targeted systems package, and so we wind up having to do a lot of research that no one thinks is research, like finding out the proper way to spawn threads, for instance. Well, you know, we've just found out a work uh, that uh, Tony Castaldo did, a PhD student who uh, just graduated here. Um, you know, we found out that matrix multiply was running a factor of two slower than it ought to in parallel, and the reason it turns out to be some OSs uh, just do a terrible job of scheduling, at least for HPC applications. And so that can actually kill something like matrix multiplies parallel performance, even though that should get almost P speed up for P processors. And just by changing the way we spawn threads, we can more than double the performance of the threading inside of an actual application like or what I would call an application, which is something like a LU factorization or a QR factorization. Um, and so we have to actually look at some very close details on this sort of thing, and we're still looking at how we can improve that sort of thing so that we can scale with the, with the architectures. Have you looked at any of the work? Um, we had Jack Dungara and one of his students on talking about the Plasma project, with, which was a, like a different type of parallelism for doing the blahs as well as multi-precision, like doing mixed precision. Uh, have you looked at any of that work, and have you implemented anything like that? Um, I do talk with the Plasma people occasionally. We, we've we actually uh, written some grants together in hopes of uh, supporting a collaboration. Uh, you know, the, the thing that they are – so, and, you know, uh, their group, the Plasma group and the Magma groups at, uh, at uh, University of uh, Tennessee in Knoxville – I do a lot of work in this area, and so does uh, Robert Van de Gein's group, uh, the Flame Group at UT Austin. Right? Both of those peop those guys, those groups, are looking at um, when you think thinking about exascale, right? Huge numbers of processors, you know, tens of thousands. Let's say something like that, right? The techniques that we've been using for parallelization essentially break down, and so you have to break the problems up. You know, you have to basically use some new math and break the problems up in ways we haven't done before so that we can keep things that, when you're thinking about a scale of 16 or 32 processors, were not serial bottlenecks that now become serial bottlenecks, you can break those problems up too. So they are looking at that. Now, those guys have to rest on top of good kernels underneath. And just because of uh, historical reasons, the only good kernels out there are basically the blocks. But these packages, once you break the problems up, would actually do better if you had a specialized BLAS. In other words, the BLAS where you know that you're calling with small sizes. The traditional BLAS do better if you call with large problem sizes, which means less fine-grained parallelism, essentially, in the techniques they're using. So they typically have a um, – those groups, both of them, they will tend to – get much greater benefit from high-level parallelism than, for instance, using a normal LA pack would, if you take plasma, for instance. But their peak performance per node is still kind of low because they're not extracting, you know, 93% of theoretical peak like a big fat DGEM call would make. And so the solution to that is to actually auto-tune some specialized kernels. Some of them may actually be matrix multiply, but they're matrix multiply where you have a known format coming in, for instance. So there's a lot of work, I think, that can be done there to make those guys get more like, so they already have great scaling, and then also to say, now with each processor, I want to get very close to peak. And that's where some, something like Atlas would come in, which is generating specialized kernels uh, that can get that close to serial peak. So a lot of the uh, vendor-provided libraries also provide uh, a LAPAC, and I noticed that... Uh, Atlas does not provide a LAPAC. Is there no benefit to optimizing LAPAC itself? Um, well, I'm guessing you must be looking at, I mean, Atlas has always, for the last 
five years or so provided some parts of LAPAC. Uh, LAPAC is a gigantic package. And so, um, you know, the Atlas group typically is me and a, a couple other guys helping me out. <laughs> so, you know, implementing all of LAPAC is not going to happen. Uh, so, but Atlas has always had, you know, from uh, probably six or seven years ago, we added a few of the factorizations, uh, LU and Chileski. Um, and that was basically based on work done by uh, Sivan Toledo and Fred Gustafson, where they showed that basically with recursion, you can beat LA PAC substantially. Um, uh, so Atlas provided those. In other words, what Atlas does is when we think that we can actually provide a better, uh, something better than LA PAC, then we provide it uh, if we can do it in a reasonable, you know, without killing ourselves. So we had that for a long time with LU and uh, Chileski. Um, and then recently we have added, uh, we've been working on QR to get it with recursion and a bunch of other techniques. And we've also developed a, uh, a uh, new technique for parallelization where um, something like similar to what the plasma group does but without new math where you just exploit the hardware in a superior way. And we showed, for instance, that that's better than what they do for certain types of problems. Um, so Atlas has got some stuff like that as well in there for LAPAC that provides that. And then finally, we are just now finishing up. Uh, Atlas has had for a while now the ability to tune LAPAC by tuning uh, something inside of LAPAC called ILEN V, which is basically the, the blocking parameter, which can make a huge difference in performance. And uh, Atlas has already been automatically doing that, and we're looking at extending that further. And finally, Atlas will now, if you give it the NetLib LA pack and point Atlas at it during the install, it will automatically build it for you. So you can get a full LA pack interface in the Fortran area, which is what the NetLib stuff provides. And then you can get a partial interface in the C area, which is what Atlas provides natively. Further in the conversation, too, are you looking uh, to have Atlas support uh, GPUs and other popular types of accelerators today? I mean, do these architectures lend themselves well to, to dense linear algebra? Yes, these architectures are pretty much ideal for dense linear algebra. Um, you know, people have reported huge speed ups by using GPUs, particularly if you do single precision. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you're aware. Uh, Jack's group uh, at uh, University of Tennessee did some work where they looked at using accelerator in single precision and using iterative refinement to uh, get a double precision answer. And by doing that, you can get on some systems a hundred fold speed up over using the CPU. So they're, they're, they're very good at dense linear algebra, these systems in single precision. Um, I am interested in them, but I have not actually done any work in much work in them, and the reason is there's already a lot of groups with a lot of that expertise. Um, I myself am not a GPU guy, and the problem with the GPU area is they use all the same things that people in architecture use. People, you know, in the CPU world, I could call it, but they don't really know anything about CPU people, I guess, because they just rename everything. So it's very hard to just go in and use your 10 years of detailed architecture experience on the GPU because they don't call it a cache. They call it a scratch area, or they don't call it a vector unit. They call it a multi-processor. Multi you know, so you have to spend hours pouring over documents to get a mental handle on the stuff. And then you actually need to adapt your software to run on it, which needs a whole different set of criteria uh, that is hidden from you. Like you can't write an assembly on most of these systems, right? Even the things they give you with assembly, for instance, don't have the assembly, the assembler does register assignment. Well, if somebody else does register assignment for you, it's a disaster, right? You can't do anything with that essentially. So you wind up having to manipulate it from a very high level. So there's all kinds of problems with it that require a lot of detailed understanding to fix. And so I don't see myself right now having the time to uh, dedicate to that. So I did have a student that I had work on it a little bit, but uh, um, they need more direction than I'm able to give them with my own present level of knowledge. So right now I feel like there's other groups doing that better and other people, since Atlas is open source, can 
roll their own mixture, if they like, uh, between Atlas and, you know, the coup de blas or something like that. So if there's all these vendor implementations out there now and there's all these different groups with expertise on other uh, GPUs, uh, what is the market for Atlas? Uh, like, w why why work on Atlas? Well, um, Atlas is is still Atlas is your best friends if you've never used Atlas, right? Uh, like I say, used to the only I mean, what, the, I began Atlas because I wished I wanted to run a uh, basically some scale pack code. Think of it that way; it wasn't quite right, but it's close enough on a cluster, and I had to use HPF to do it. We were needing to use that. But Sun at that point had just made their license, their their BLAS package proprietary, and you could only use it if you used their compiler, which meant that my 32-node cluster ran slower than a single processor. That's why Atlas actually began, was because my parallel programs were no good because the vendors were not allowing me to call their optimized libraries unless I used their routines, which I couldn't because of certain parallel constraints. Um, and so what Atlas does is allow everyone access. So it's certainly free as in price. It's also free as in freedom, right? Atlas has an open source license. That everyone gets to use it however they like. Um, so a lot of people use Atlas, I think, just for the freedom. Um, but also, as I said, prior to Atlas, when Atlas first came out, it was actually beating the vendor almost all the time because they essentially didn't have any competition. So even if all you ever want to use in your life is MKL, the fact that Atlas is there makes MKL faster. Um, and so, you know, obviously you're not going to make a lot of money selling a library that, if you're selling it that's slower than something that's available for free. Um, so they typically, you know, the speed of your MKL code is pushed up by the fact that Atlas is there. Uh, but, you know, even if, even if uh, the vendor's libraries would be incredibly efficient, uh, there's still a huge place for something that's open and free. Uh, and, and as I said before in the prior question, Atlas still wins often uh, on certain cases by a large amount just because they haven't tuned those cases. So let me ask you a question about uh, binary portability here. So if if I have two platforms that are, are binary compatible with each other, let's say I have a Nehalem-based machine and a Westmere-based machine and they're running the same operating system and same support libraries and all these kinds of things. And I compile Atlas and my application on, on the Nehalem. Can I just take it over to the Westmere or are there potentially optimizations that I'm missing on that new chipset? Or how does that kind of portability generally work or, or not work? Um, it generally does not work, right? I mean, the whole point of Atlas is it is – in that automatic tuning process, it is tailoring itself to the exact system it finds. So when you, you know, take an historical example, when you tune for the P4 and then you want to run on the core too, the P4 code may do, it's, it's almost certain to do better than um, the reference blocks, right? But it's not going to do nearly as well as just Atlas reinstalled to this new architecture um, because you know, one of the worst things that can happen is what if they change the L1 size? Uh, to give you an historical example, when they went from the P4, the original P4 had an 8K cache. Um, uh, but the P3, which came before it, had a 16K cache. So if you took the P3 kernel with a cache blocking for a 16K cache and you ran it on the P4 guy, you would not get L1 blocking. You would get L2 blocking because that guy overflows the, the, the little AK cache, and therefore your performance would be, you know, drastically reduced. And then, you know, this is true of every place. You know, the vendor blahs give you an illusion sometimes that you are, uh, you can run it on any system, and you can. Like MKL is very good at this. You know, you can link the same library. But the reason is they've actually got 50, got 50 different versions of that library internally, and when you make a function call that actually probes your system real time and selects which variant to call, and that's, you know, they basically have fat libraries, and that's how they manage to build something that can work well uh, across architectures. But the whole point of tuning is to make it specific to the architecture. So because Atlas is automatically tuned when it's compiled, 
should special care be taken when building Atlas to make sure that nothing else is running, there's no other users on that login node? That's the ideal case. In the ideal case, you run Atlas alone on the machine. And in that case, so Atlas is built kind of at the lowest common denominator. So if you install Atlas just with normal flags, it uses a CPU timer so that uh, for all the non-parallel work, you can't use a CPU timer for the parallel work, but for the non-parallel work, use a CPU timer in order to, with the idea that you're not able to run it on the machine alone. When you are able to run it on the machine alone, you can look in the Atlas install guide, it tells you how to do this. You can tell it to use a wall clock timer, which has much greater resolution and will give you a much more quality install. So Atlas will work almost regardless of the load, but if the load gets high enough, the timings it's doing to tune itself become essentially random number generators. Um, so then it's not going to do a very good job. You know, it's still be better than reference flaws when you're done, but it'll be far from optimal. Um, another related area to that is you have to turn off uh, CPU throttling, which most OSs do either for desktops now, because that really makes all timing completely random um, on something that, you know, no two timings in a row look the same. So uh, you have to turn that off to get a, a, a good Atlas install. So what language is, is Atlas written in? What languages do you support, uh, you know, for applications? I heard you mention C and Fortran earlier. Is, is the scope larger than that? Well, Atlas provides uh, interfaces to the C and LAPAC libraries, excuse me, to, sorry, to the BLAS and LAPAC libraries in a C and Fortran 77 interfaces. Now, Atlas itself is implemented entirely in ANSI C. So uh, now there's install scripts and so on written in shell, and there's a lot of make files, right? So the dependency tree for Atlas is Unix style shell, Unix style make, and an ANSI C compiler. If you've gotten those, you can pretty much install Atlas. Now, it's very helpful. It's very hard these days to install Atlas without GCC. What GCC provides is Atlas also optionally has a whole boatload of assembly files, which it tries on your system. And those are, it, we like to use GCC to do our assembly uh, to, as our assembler, because we can use the CPP macro to uh, write much cleaner assembly that way. So those are really the, the dependencies that, that you have. Um, now, Atlas is actually callable from almost every language, but that's not done by me. You know, like, for instance, uh, SciPy, Scientific Python, um, they did a lot of work integrating Atlas into their library. As a matter of fact, um, there was a guy, uh, Piru Peterson, who did a lot of work on Atlas 3.6 in order to make it callable. You know, he helped me with a lot of things like figuring out how to use dynamic libraries, which Python demands. So you can find an API for other languages besides C and Fortran, but that's done by other people, uh, not me. Well, follow up on that then. Do you ever expand or ever plan to expand your Fortran to support to uh, have, say, a Fortran 90-like module or any of the newer constructs that are available in Fortran 2003 and the upcoming 2008 and so on. I mean, I know, I know that's not strictly BLAS, but uh, uh, there are some uh, nice things available there for application programmers. Yeah. Um, I have not thought to do so just because I don't think I'm particularly – I'm any better suited for it than anybody else, right? Uh, the only thing I can think optimization-wise, you know, that's nice about 490 modules, for instance, you know, people talk a lot about wanting to do the, the tiny blahs. You know, in other words, blahs that are optimized for, let's say, what if you're doing a vector copy of only 40 elements? Well, with a module, you can, you can basically do overloading where you have a special case code for that that avoids a function call. There's some tricks like that you can pull that are optimization. But otherwise, it's really a packaging issue. You know, what's pretty? Um, and I don't feel like, you know, that is neither my expertise nor something, you know, that I would have any reason I would do well, right? So I tend to concentrate on the other end. So I doubt I'm going to do it unless uh, the – Unless someone outside of Atlas does it and, say, and, and says, okay, uh, other people are using this, why don't you put it into Atlas? That might be a way that I might bring in something higher level than what it's doing. But I concentrate on the low level because 
that's really Atlas's job, and there's many other people who write higher level stuff over the top of it. So if you're targeting, uh, you know, parallelism inside the machine, multi-core and things like that, what effects do you guys or, or how much do you investigate the, the effects of memory and processor affinity and how much code have you had to written to support that kind of stuff? Well, that's been, as I mentioned earlier, that was a topic of uh, uh, one of the topics that my PhD student uh, did for his dissertation, uh, Tony Castaldo. Um, the thing I talked about, how to spawn threads, that's very tied to affinity. And what we're finding is that if you don't have affinity on, um, your performance when you have problems that aren't huge, the, the operating system has an enormous impact on how it schedules those threads. And as a matter of fact, you can take something, you can more than double the speed of an application simply by making the scheduling good. Uh, so we, uh, Tony did that research. Um, he found a solution to it by using affinity. And it's not just affinity, but you have to uh, look at when you start processes up on which processors so that they never interfere with each other is the basic idea. So it's not just to use affinity. Affinity alone doesn't solve all your problems, uh, but you have to have it to solve your problems. So we've been doing a lot of research. And so we originally did that. We published a paper on it, um, uh, published an IPDPS. But... Uh, what we've been trying to do is find some way, so what happens if you're on a system like FreeBSD and its derivatives like OS X? They don't have processor affinity. And therefore, they're losing a fact, and they do seem to do the same terrible scheduling that we observed that some versions of Linux did, that Windows did, blah, blah, blah. Um, and... And when I say terrible scheduling, I want to say that, I want to qualify that. HPC, I'm sure what they're doing makes sense for somebody. But for HPC, it's terrible scheduling because what they do is they often start threads on the same processor that the threads are already running on. So if you spawn off eight threads, you'll only be using six processors or something like that. So along the same lines then is, uh, you know, Intel's hyper-threading technology and other CPU vendors had similar things. And they've been getting more... HPC friendly with Nehalem and they got a little better again in Westmere. But do you see any of the benefits with a really careful scheduling for hyperthreading, or is it still pretty much either a wash or a negative? Well, the Intel's version of hyperthreading, you don't see a lot of benefit and in linear algebra. And the reason is the following. What 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 their hyperthreading does is it says uh, most applications cannot drive the back end of the architecture at their theoretical peak. Therefore, we have basically idle horsepower to be used. So in order to get around that, we're going to spawn multiple threads to the same processor, and we're going to mix their instruction streams at the architectural level. And since nobody was running at the peak of the machine before, uh, the excess slack that was left over on the slowest piece of the back end that you're depending on can be absorbed by this extra thread. Now, the problem with that in dense linear algebra is dense linear algebra is typically already running with only one thread at the theoretical peak, essentially, of the FPU. You're driving the FPU at 92% of theoretical peak, which is just about as fast as you can drive it. And therefore, when you add the extra hyperthread in, all it does is it stomps on your cache. So you wind up with something that, in an application anyway, does not give you much of a speed up for, an eight, for a dense linear algebra code. So uh, for Intel hyperthreading, that's what I've seen, that, that, you know, because the serial code can drive the FPU at its maximal rate, it's not that helpful. Now, there are some other systems where a single thread cannot drive the uh, FPU at anywhere near its rate. The one that I'm aware of is Sun Niagara. Um, even though it has a very low floating point peak, if you need to spawn multiple threads to the same processor in order to reach that peak. It's, one of the, it's the only system I'm aware of that, you know, normally when you have parallelism, multiple threads to the same processor, throughput goes up, but actual time to completion goes, uh, is worse, right? But on that system, that's not true. You can actually get bigger mega flops if you run two threads than you can if you run one. So in other words, parallel efficiency is more efficient with two threads than, than with one. Um, 
So, but anyway, so that's why hyper-threading has so far not been a big issue, uh, uh, Intel's version. Um, like I say, Sun and IBM have a different take of something that's similar to hyper-threading, and that's uh, trickier. So what's the contact point for Atlas, a, a website, place to download it? Yeah, um, we're at math-atlas.sourceforge.net is Atlas's main homepage. Um, I just recently moved all of the base files, in other words, the, so in other words, the development stuff is on GitHub these days uh, due to an extended SourceForge uh, outage and my just needing to use a more modern tool. I was using CBS before. So that's where that mostly is. There's several Atlas developer, several mailing lists you can sign up to at SourceForge. Um, uh, there's a support. Most of the support is done with a SourceForge tracker. And, you know, you'll typically talk to me eventually when you get down to the bottom of that. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Clint. Uh, this show will be out soon, and we'll talk to you again soon. All right. Thanks. We appreciate your time. All right. Thanks. Thanks.